Sodium ionic compounds that contain transition metals. So, um, my son's name is Jacob, and he is one of many Jacobs in his grade at this point. So, in order to figure out which Jacob was which, uh, his teachers actually call them by like Jacob Sturman and Jacob, like throw in a last name. So, when we have metals. Uh, especially transition metals that will take multiple charges we sort of have to do the same thing we can't just call this iron any longer because iron actually comes in two different forms we've got an iron uh, down here that takes a plus two charge and an iron that takes a plus three charge so we're gonna need a way to uh, tell the reader which iron we're talking about and we to do that we use a Roman numeral right here and the Roman numeral simply tells you what the charge of the iron is. So here, iron with the Roman numeral 2 tells you you have a plus 2 charge. And iron with a Roman numeral 3 tells you that you have a plus 3 charge on the iron. So let's give one of these a shot. Here we have iron with oxygen attached. So the first step that we're going to do is we're going to figure out what the charge of this iron actually is. So I'm going to write out iron but I don't know its charge right now, and oxygen that has a negative 2 charge. You remember that it's um, in the 16th family, so it's going to take, it's got 6 valence electrons, and it's going to try and gain 2 electrons, giving it a negative 2 ion. The other thing you need to remember is that compounds always have 0 total charge. So in order to get 0 total charge, our iron has to take a plus 2 charge. So that will balance out my negative 2 charge on the oxygen. So when I name this thing, I'm going to need to use my iron 2 because I have an iron that has a plus 2 charge. So I'm going to write down iron with a 2 in parentheses oxide. And again, the 2 tell, is told to me by the Roman numeral. Okay, over here. Let's write this one out. I'm going to write it out the long way just so I can prove a point here. I'm going to have three O's. Uh, each O I know takes a negative two charge. All along, you're, every time you see a compound that has oxygen in it, you can know right away that oxygen is most likely taking a minus two charge. So let's say we don't know what charge the two irons are going to take. We'll just call them X for the moment. But what I do know is that the total charge on this compound has to be zero. So I can set up a little algebra equation here and say that if I have two unknowns plus three negative twos, and that whole thing needs to be zero, then I can solve for x here, and I can find out that x equals a positive three. So that means that my iron must be taking a positive three charge here. So when I name it, I can name it iron with a positive three charge bonded to oxygen, which is oxide. Iron 3 oxide. Again, the charge is shown by the Roman numeral right there. Why do we need a Roman numeral? Again, some metals can take more than one charge. Uh, where would you find those metals? Generally in the transition metal section. Some of them sneak into family 13 and 14. Um, if in doubt, I would give it a Roman numeral. If you look on our ion sheet and it has a Roman numeral next to its name, be sure to use it. The Roman numeral, again, always indicates the charge that is on the metal. And the Roman numeral never tells you the number of metal atoms that are present in the compound. The Roman numeral simply tells you the charge that the metal is going to take. So let's try another one of these. Um, so here we have tungsten, which is W, and sulfur. So what we have is tungsten, and we don't know its charge, but we know we have two sulfurs. And sulfur is an oxygen's family, so it's going to take a minus two charge. So what charge would the tungsten have to take in order to give me a total charge of zero? Well, tungsten's going to have to take a plus four charge to balance out these two negative twos. So when I write it, I can come down here, oh, look at that. Tungsten does have an ion that is a plus four ion. So we can say that this is now tungsten 
and we indicate the charge with the Roman numeral and we call it sulfide. Okay, now, of course, since the wife set this thing up with tungsten with three S's, you can pretty much guess that it's going to be the plus six ion, but let's walk through it anyway and say, okay, I've got tungsten, but I don't know what charge it has, and I've got three sulfurs that each take a minus two charge. So what charge does this tungsten have to take? Well, it's got to take a plus six. And when I name it, I'm going to say that it is tungsten with a six charge VI sulfide. Now, if for any reason you don't know your Roman numerals from say one to eight, it's probably a safe bet, then what you should do now at this point is go through and look them up because you will need to know your Roman numerals from one to eight. That'd be a, a pretty safe bet. Let's have you try some on your own. So I want you to try these two. What is the name of copper with two chlorines attached? And what is the name of a compound that is a lead with uh, two sulfurs attached? So pause the video at this point and take a look at what you think and then restart the video. Okay, now that you've had a try at these, let's give it a shot. Um, here's what we initially know about the copper with the chlorine. Copper, we don't know its charge, but chlorine, we know, since it's a halogen, will take a negative one. And since there are two chlorines there, um, we know that the two chlorines are going to give us a total charge of negative two. And so we're going to need a positive two charge in order to balance that. So it's going to be copper two chloride. So the two indicates that the copper is taking a plus two charge. And over here, we initially don't know anything about the lead, but we know that sulfur, being an oxygen's family, takes a negative two charge. Since we've got two of these, two sulfur minus twos, our lead is going to have to take a plus four charge. And in order to indicate that one, we write the name. We're going to write lead four sulfide, so with a positive four charge. Now let's turn the process around. So say this time I gave you a formula say copper 1 phosphide and we want to turn it into a chemical formula or right. so copper 1 let's look it up copper 1 over here it's gonna look like this copper with positive 1 charge so we'll write that one out copper with a plus 1 charge and phosphide is gonna be a P and it's a nitrogen's family and it will generally take a negative 3 charge so a plus 1 and a negative 3 do not balance out but if I had three of these coppers, Cu plus one and Cu plus one, then these three would balance out my negative three charge. So I'm gonna write Cu with a subscript of three and a P. So I'll have three negative one charges to balance out my one negative, or three positive one charges to balance out my one negative three charge. Okay, let's try again. Tin 2 fluoride. Well, let's look up tin here. Tin 2, ah, here it is. Um, and it's got a plus 2 charge. I didn't really need to look it up because this Roman numeral right here already tells me that I have a plus 2. So tin, SN, taking a plus 2 charge. And I have fluorine that is a halogen, and I know halogens take a negative 1 charge. So the charges are not balanced, they do not equal 0. So in order to make that happen, I'd need a second fluorine. So now I'll have two negative ones to balance out my positive two. And I can rewrite that as a tin with an F and a two. Two Fs, two negative one charges, balancing out a positive two charge. I've got one more note I want to make before I set you off on your own. Um, the mercury one ion is slightly different than all the other ions in here. And if you take a look, mercury 1, right here, mercury 1, exists this way. And it's different because it's diatomic. And what that means is that it occurs as an Hg2. Um, two mercuries come together to give you a plus 2 charge. So each individual mercury must have a plus 1 charge. 
but this never gets written. We always write it as two mercuries put together. It's a little strange, but you'll get used to it. So let's take a look at uh, a formula that's going to include the mercury one ion in it. So mercury one is going to be Hg2 with a plus two charge, and iodine is a halogen, so it'll be I with a negative one. Again, the two and the one don't balance out, so I'm going to need a second minus one charge. Um, and I'm going to write that as Hg2I2. So the astute student is going to notice, well, wait a minute, I have two uh, subscripts here that are twos. Shouldn't I reduce that to an Hgi? And the answer is no. Because of this ion uh, occurs diatomically, we're going to leave it in this format, Hg2I2. Again, I want you to try some on your own. So what is the formula for iron 3 sulfide? And what is the formula for iron 2 chloride? So if we're going to be grammatically correct here, let me add some stuff in and say question mark there. So pause the video at this point and write down the two formulas and check back in, see how you did. Okay, well, how'd you do? Initially, we know that if it's iron 3 sulfide, that means that the iron is taking a plus 3 charge. Sulfur is in oxygen's family. We always know that oxygen family is going to take a minus 2 charge. And in this case, I'll try a different method. And I'm going to say, let's look for the lowest common multiple. So if we've got a 3 and a 2, the lowest common multiple of a 3 and a 2 is a 6. So we're going to need two of these to make six, and we're going to need three of the sulfurs to make six. So I'll need Fe2S3. With the mercury-2 chloride, we know initially that mercury is going to take a plus two charge. That's what the mercury-2 stands for. And chloride is going to take a minus one charge. So you can pretty easily see that you're going to need two chlorine ions, uh, chloride ions, sorry, and one mercury Two ion and those things will balance out to give you HgCl2. So check back in for the third video in this series when we're going to take a look at polyatomic ions. Good luck everybody!